exactly where. I'm not sure. <laughs> somewhere, somewhere there. We'll we'll kind of start with um, chapter three again. Before we do, though, let's uh, put our Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the study of Thy Word and for the message that it uh, gives to us. We pray, Father, that we may cherish the things that are disclosed to us here. And we may use these to guide us in this present world. We thank Thee for these prophets who spoke of old, who spoke with boldness. We pray, Father, that we also may speak boldly as the need arises to declare thy word. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Let's start uh, chapter 3. I think we're down a little further than that, but uh, <clears throat> we can go over, the, uh, go over it again quickly. Second time uh, Jonah was sent to Nineveh, whether he had been home first or not, uh, it could be, but not sure. But he was, again, advised to arise and go to that great city of Nineveh. This time he was a priest to it before he said that uh, he was to cry out to it. So he arose. He, If it's from his home, he arose, uh, went to Nineveh, which he should have done in the first place, now, Nineveh was a great city. Uh, you know, great cities nowadays, given the population of the world, uh, there are a few cities with millions and millions of people. Houston's one of them. It's not real certain exactly how many, uh, what the population of Nineveh or the extent of Nineveh at the time, but it may have been in excess of half a million people. So it's, it was a big city. Three day, day journey in extent. That may be because he was uh, preaching as he went. And it says here, uh, in verse 4, Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. And he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And we mentioned the fact that uh, during this time, uh, uh, Syria was in some sort of political turmoil. There was a period about 60 years uh, during which uh, Jonah was uh, preaching to the Ninevites where they were uh, pressed about from enemies without and had uh, political turmoil within. So they were in a very distressed uh, circumstance. And it may be that uh, people are more receptive to the message of the gospel when they're under great stress. When things are going fine, you know, like I said, when the uh, 401k is doing well and what have you, the people are not so uh, readily receptive to the gospel message, but when things are really bad, when they are really troubled, then they, uh, their heart's prepared, if you will, to receive the gospel message. So. Not a bad thing that they uh, uh, went uh, underwent this thing. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed the fast and put on sackcloth and the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he rose from the throne, put on sackcloth, and he uh, sat in ashes. This this was a common. Uh, uh, circumstance and common approach to when there was great mourning to be done. They put on sackcloth and sit in ashes. And it says here that they also covered their animals with it, their beasts. And that was not uncommon either. That was a, a way of uh, declaring to people that they were mourning something. In this case, they were, they were mourning their uh, spiritual condition, the fact that they were going to be destroyed if they didn't repent. So they did, and they, they uh, said, who can tell, verse 9, who can tell if God will turn 
and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so they we may, may not perish. Now this fierce anger uh, applies to anyone that is disobedient uh, to the will of God and does so willingly. And that was the case with the Assyrians. They were not the chosen people of God. They were not the Jews. But they were still amenable to God and to the laws of God. They were still amenable to it. And when they had disobeyed what they were amenable to, then God's anger uh, was unleashed and punishment had to, had to happen. But in verse 10, then God, God saw their works that they had turned from their evil way and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would do, bring upon them, and he did not do it. So the very thing that Jonah dreaded happened. He wanted uh, Nineveh to be destroyed. He didn't want them to be saved. So in verse uh, chapter 4, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. Because the very thing that he didn't want happened. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, oh Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Now, if he knew all these things beforehand, why did he flee to begin with? If he knew that was the nature of God, and he says he, you know, that's God's nature, and he was certainly uh, appreciative in chapter two when the great fish vomited him, or he's, he's inside the great fish and he prayed to God. <clears throat> he was certainly uh, cognizant of. God's loving kindness then but that's when God was doing what he wanted he wanted out of the fish but now that he's in Nineveh and God is doing what he doesn't want he still admits the, the uh, characteristics of God he still admits it but he says in verse 3, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. It's a very uh, petulant attitude on the part of Jonah. He just, it's almost like a child going off in the corner and sticking a thumb in their mouth and, and curling up and just pouting. It's very petulant on his part. And the Lord, <clears throat> being the Lord, said, Is it right for you to be angry? And this is a, uh, uh, a question of the right or wrong of a situation, of an event. Within itself, was God exercising his characteristics? Was it right or was it wrong? Well, it was right. It was right that God uh, adhered to what his character was. He could not deny himself. He, because of God's character, he had to uh, do what he did. Is that right or is that wrong? Well, he was right. Did Jonah answer the question? Well, no. <clears throat> so Jonah went out of the city and sat on, a, on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under, under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city still hoping that God would destroy the city. But like any uh, country boy, you know, he found himself some shade. He was enjoying the shade and just anticipating 
that maybe, maybe, just maybe, God will change his mind and destroy the city. And the Lord God prepared, in verse 6, prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from the, uh, his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. So Jonah was thankful for something. He was thankful for that which benefited him directly. But he was still angry that God did not destroy the Ninevites. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm, so it, it, and it so damaged the plant that it withered. Kind of reminds me of vine borers when it comes to squash. <laughs> you can have beautiful squash and get a vine board, and next day it's dead in a doornail. But this happened all in one uh, one night. The next day, uh, 24 hours really that it happened in, And it happened, of course, the plant had already withered, and so whatever shade it provided was gone. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that it, he grew faint. If, for those of you uh, farm gals and farm boys, you ever been out uh, working the fields all day long? It can get pretty hot, and you can feel, uh, especially if you don't have any water, you can, you can feel pretty faint sometimes. Well, he grew faint. He, then he wished death for himself. This is the second time that he uh, wished death for himself and said, it is better for me to die than to live. Now, why was it better for him, at least in his view, to die than to live? Well, it's probably not because of the uh, the uh, force of the sun, the heat and faint and the, you know, all that stuff. Is, it really is because he didn't get it away. But the Lord said, You have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. He had concern for that plant. In verse 11, the Lord said, And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and also much livestock? Jonah had more concern for for something that benefited him personally that in and of itself had very little value. One little plant had really very little value. And he did not want that plant destroyed. But when it came to human life, which had infinitely more value than one little plant, he wanted that destroyed. Uh, that is, and he knows the nature of God, and he knew that, that God would not, uh, if, if at all possible, he would not destroy people. So what's the lesson for us? Well, it certainly is to keep things uh, in perspective to ascertain the value of things and the thing the things that we have are not nearly as valuable as the people with whom we uh, associate is not as valuable as uh, any person especially those of the household of faith things should not get in, in the way of our relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, or with a lost and dying world. 
they are infinitely more valuable than the things that we possessed because the things that we possess will someday belong to somebody else. You cannot take them with you. So any questions or comments? Yes, sir. What did it ask? What did it ask? Well, I do know that uh, Jesus, when he was uh, dealing with the Pharisees, he said, in the, you know, you want a sign, but the only sign that you're going to get is the uh, sign of Jonah to the Ninevites. So in some respect, Jonah was a sign, an indication of something to the Ninevites. And no doubt, uh, when I say no doubt, I, I suspect that the Ninevites had heard about Jonah and the great fish uh, before this because, you know, news gets around. And as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, uh, Jesus said he would be, he would, that would be his sign. He would be in the, the uh, belly of the earth for three days. So uh, in that respect, it's a uh, prophetic uh, indication of what Jesus would do, would go through in order to um, become the Paschal Lamb for the rest of us. So. He loved all men. It was, that was the. Uh, you know, when we covered uh, um, Obadiah, that, that wasn't the Jews. God loved them. And uh, so, you know, God, what this is indicating that God loves every man. He chose the Jews because that is, it was through the Jews that the uh, Christ was going to come. He chose them, but he expected everybody to be obedient. He loved everybody. He expected everybody to be obedient. Now, they had, they had a different law, but they expected everybody to be obedient. Uh, they had to discount some of the uh, prophets. They had to do it. I mean, the Jonah is, the message is very clear. It's very clear. And we get over to the next uh, book we're going to cover is Amos. And, of course, that's primarily directed to, to Israel. But the first six nations, if you want to call that, that Amos uh, gets after are not Jewish. They're not Jewish at all. And he spends very little time on Judah. Most of it is spent on uh, Israel. But the fact that he spends time on six non-Jewish nations indicates that he expects them to be obedient also to do that which is right and that he must, because of his nature, punish them when they uh, don't do right. So I'm not sure that 
that answers your question as best best I can hear what your question is, which is not very good. Any other comments or questions? Well, next one we get to is uh, Amos, and uh, interesting character in many respects. Uh, what do we know about Amos? We know that he was a herdsman, probably a, a sheep. He was a sheep herder. Uh, from Tekoa. <clears throat> Tekoa is located, uh, well, let's, let's put it this way, Bethlehem is located about halfway between Tekoa and Jerusalem and very close to the uh, uh, Dead Sea. They're all on the, that'd be the west side of the Dead Sea. And he was, uh, uh, to be a prophet to the nation of Israel, but he was actually in Judah during the time of Uzzah, and of course uh, Jeroboam II was the king of Israel. And the name Amos itself means um, burden carrier, or burden, and he was tasked with a tremendous burden that was to uh, preach to the nation of Israel, to these other nations around about, but primarily to the nation of Israel. And when we talk about the, the six nations that he deals with first, their problem was that they were uh, cruel in some respect, but the problem with Judah and Israel was they were disobedient to the law that they had been given. Of course, Israel was uh, at the time much worse than Judah. I might say that this uh, prophecy prophet lived during the same period of time that, that uh, Jonah and the, uh, the others lived. It was a time when Assyria was in decline, and uh, Jeroboam II and, and uh, Uzzah had really expanded the strength of both Israel and Judah, and it affected both of them. You know, sometimes I think that prosperity has its downfalls. You know, everybody <laughs> wants to be prosperous, I guess. But there's a great danger in prosperity. I've always said that uh, money is a great servant, but a terrible master. And that apparently was the case with... Uh, with these people in Amos's time, Amos, that the area of Tekoa, and the fact that he was a uh, herdsman and a, a dresser of sycamore trees, sycamore tree, uh, best I can describe it is kind of like a fig tree in some respects. It uh, produced a fruit, and I think there's some figs. You know, David could probably tell me about this, there's some fruits that you have to pinch them to make them ripen. You have to pinch them or poke a hole in them. Do something like that. And make a big shade tree, the one I climbed up in, had figs, about half the size of the figs that we have. Yeah. They grew all over it. And uh, that's, when it says he was a dresser, he, 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 he had to do that sort of stuff. That kind of stuff. Yeah. And that was primarily uh, uh, consumed by the poor people, not the rich people. 
I, I've never seen the sycamore tree or you know, certainly have never had the fruit. Well, it's actually called a sycamine. This sycamine. The King James translators did know sycamine or strict so they <laughs> put sycamore because they knew that. Yeah. Well, I don't know either one of them. <laughs> I barely know fig trees. <laughs> But anyway, he was addressing those, and, and that kind of fruit, you, he had to do something to it to make it ripen, or otherwise it wouldn't ripen. So uh, he did that, but the area that he lived in, Tekoa, it was a pretty rough area. And he tended uh, sheep, some sort of special kind of sheep. I'm not, I'm not doing much up on sheep either. <laughs> but, he tended sheep, and it was a very rocky, and it, it was a hard life. It was a hard life. <clears throat> but it made him a hard man. And that was exactly the type of person that was needed to go from Judah to Israel and preach to them. Now, you can imagine that uh, uh, Israel was in a time of great prosperity and we'll see that when we get to where the uh, prophecy against Judah uh, begins but other than that we don't really know too much about uh, Amos we have no history before that and once he was had done the prophesying you don't hear more about him so that's about all that we know, but we do know that his uh, demeanor, his nature, was exactly that which was needed to prophesy to Israel because it was going to be rough. But he's, he's used to that. He's used to uh, rough conditions, a rough life, and it was nothing to him to go up to Israel and uh, proclaim God's message to the Israelites. Now, one characteristic of uh, Amos's preaching to the Israelites was that he was uh, as austere in his preaching as he was in his life. He did not care about the feelings of the Israelites. So that would have uh, made him politically incorrect today. <laughs> he had to be concerned about the feelings of others. But the gospel message really doesn't care about your feelings either. The gospel message is that if you want to be saved, you must be obedient to the gospel, to its call, to the demands of the gospel. You must be obedient to it. If you have uh, some sort of uh, inhibitions or some sort of uh, uh, emotional response to it, fine. It still doesn't change the message. A gospel message does not care about your feelings, and neither does did uh, Amos. He was he told them exactly what they needed to hear. It was unvarnished it was brutally frank and given their um, material wealth and the way that they abused that material wealth that's exactly what was needed so let's see here Now, as I said, the uh, during the this ninth century B.C., and that's when this uh, likely occurred, likely was written. Uh, Syria was yes, sort of in the decline. Yeah, they were having problems, let's just say, 
that you know they were extending their power before this time but for a period of about 60 years they uh, had pressure from uh, tribes or nation in the north had some internal uh, conflicts too so they were uh, kind of in decline their leaders were not very strong during that time and when uh, Nicholas uh, Pelezer came on the scene after the 60-year period that all changed he began a rapid rapid expansion of the power of Assyria and that uh, brought pressure upon Israel and, and of course eventually Syria uh, destroyed Israel if you will but in Israel uh, the luxury was you know, the, the opulence was just uh, manifestly uh, evident and they like to apparently like to flaunt it and because of that and that really uh, whether it was the cause of or a uh, symptom of their moral decline their religious decline it's probably a little bit of both but you know when they were spiritual decline there's going to be corruption of some sort. There's going to be material. But something has to, to um, occupy the uh, love, if you will, of people. If they ignore the spiritual, then the material has to take, take a precedence. And that was the uh, problem there. They had a moral decline. They were they were they had the manifestation of being very religious but it was all shallow it was all just for display they weren't really serious about it all their religious activities were corrupt and even their treatment of the uh, by the by the rich people tre treatment of the poor people was absolutely atrocious so for all these reasons, there was a simple message that uh, Amos delivered, and that was doom. Because of the way that you are, you are doomed unless you repent. And he doesn't mention repentance all that much. There are some implications that of uh, repentance, but he doesn't. Or, uh, mention it all that much but then nevertheless they were destined for doom if they did not change their ways and he predicts that they'll be taken off into captivity now I don't know what the similar situation would be here you know we were taken captive I guess you could say we were taken captive and we were taken out to West Texas. That, that may be something pretty bad. I don't know. Or, uh, but there are a lot of places in this country that we could be uh, taken captive and exiled to, and we wouldn't be all that concerned about it. We could still do what we uh, do as Christians anywhere that we go. But you have to keep in mind that this is Israel the way they viewed themselves was that they were the chosen people of God they were special people and anybody that wasn't one of them had no relationship with God at all they could not be in a covenant relationship with God and of course I think that was uh, Jonah's problem so what would exile do to somebody of that uh, thinking you know they couldn't approach God acceptably to them unless they uh, were in their home country of Israel they couldn't do it so if they were exiled in a, to a heathen nation you know they just couldn't acceptably worship God in those heathen nations so it was a much more serious uh, event to them than it would be to us. You know, we can worship God uh, anywhere. 
but they couldn't. They couldn't. So it was a very serious matter to them. <clears throat> One of the messages or emphasis of the book is that um, the wicked are going to be punished. I don't care if it's Jewish nation, the non-Jewish nation, the wicked are going to be punished. And when it comes to a nation, as the psalmist said, uh, righteousness exalt, uh, exalts a nation, but uh, sin is a reproach to any people. That, that can happen on a national level, too. So that is something that and of course, our concern would be the United States. Is there righteousness prevailing in this land today? Or is it a nation of sin? If it's a nation of sin, then there must be a national repentance. It's a terrible thing when the government of any country establishes policies that are an affront to a threat to righteous living. It makes it difficult to live righteously. And would anyone say today that our nation has um, approved laws or approved conduct of people that flies in the face of righteousness? Do we have anything that has governmental, federal governmental sanction that is an unrighteous act? Anybody here of Roe versus Wade? There are many other things besides that, but that's, uh, that's one of them. So we'll uh, maybe begin the uh, first chapter here uh, next week.